<clears throat> well, thanks, uh, Mazi, uh, for that introduction. Thanks, Demetra, and the rest of the FinJS uh, crew uh, for inviting TT and letting us tell some of our story. Um, it's, it's funny you're, you're kind, uh, Mazi, but I, I think we, we doubted whether or not we'd be able to pull off uh, the things that we've pulled off over the last few years ourselves. Um, really, until, until recently, I think, um, even internally at TT, we, we've had some doubters. Uh, just a very quick um, introduction of our firm. I suspect most people in this room uh, know a little bit about TT. I know there's lots of our customers in here. Um, and that's, that's largely probably due to the fact that we've been around for a long time, at least in terms of uh, the standards of, of this industry. We've been around for almost 25 years. Um, and we've made a name for ourselves by catering to, as Mazi mentioned, or referred to, some really, really extreme use cases, uh, very sophisticated, very extreme use cases and users. Um, the part of the story I want to talk about today, though, is really the last five years, because five years ago, we decided we needed to start over. <clears throat> we needed to take the platform that had, that had really helped us thrive for 20 years um, and rewrite the thing from the ground up. And I suspect that there's lots of CTOs and lots of folks in engineering in this room. Um, if you haven't already gone through something like this, um, I, I suspect in this industry, if you stay in this industry, you will. Um, there's a lot of legacy technology in capital markets. Um, and I think the web platform and JavaScript have matured enough to the point, both in terms of technology, but also in terms of acceptance, where you're going to start to see more and more migrations and trans transformations of legacy technology like the one we went through. Um, but our story starts about five years ago. Um, on the surface, externally, everything looked really good about TT. Uh, we enjoyed a position at, at the very top of our industry. Uh, our, most of our clients loved us. Uh, we were in every major bank uh, globally. Uh, revenues were, were good and growing. The business w was solid. Um, people knew us and, and loved us for our stability. Um, we were really catering to the, the, the highest and, and the most sophisticated uh, end users in the industry. We were also known for having a front end um, that, was, that was always available and always very responsive, even in the most extreme uh, market data conditions. Um, but if you dig a little bit deeper, and, and, and we did, and as you start to, to sort of peel away the layers of the onion, um, as much as we were known for stability, we were also known uh, for an incredibly long uh, release cycle. Um, and this was a function of a few things. Um, Number one, we had a massive code base that just grew and grew and grew over 20 years. Thousands of engineers had their hands in it. In and of itself, not a bad thing. There's lots of really large code bases that, are, that can be very iterative, um, that can be very nimble. Um, but it was also a code base where the front end, the, the, the client application, and the various components on the server were, were in incredibly, it was very monolithic. They were inextricably linked. Um, again, I've seen uh, uh, large code bases that have a very coupled client and server um, be able to, to be very iterative. But what really made things bad for us was we had no control over when we were able to update various components of our architecture, largely because we count some of the largest and most conservative banks as our clients. Um, and they have their own ideas around security, around packaging, around when and where and how they upgrade software. So suffice it to say, we had do literally dozens of versions of our application, all backwards and forwards compatible, because we never knew, uh, no application knew what other versions uh, the other components were going to be. Suffice it to say, it was a, it was a recipe for disaster. And, and we saw this. Um, again, the, the outward looking in, things looked good. Uh, but the rate of change in our industry was continuing to increase. And the rate of our ability to deliver new features and new functionality was continuing to, to decrease. And we just knew that that spelled trouble ahead. Um, so, so we made the, the, the fairly drastic and, and um, uh, scary, frankly, uh, decision to, to rebuild this thing from the ground up. So um, once we kind of made that mental leap and, and, and we knew we were going to rebuild this thing from the ground up, uh, we, we went back to the drawing board and we, we asked ourselves, <clears throat> over the last 20 years, what lessons have we learned? You know, what, what wrongs can we right? Um, and, and, and really, how can we set ourselves up not just to deliver a better platform for our clients, but also one that's going to not only let us thrive for the next 20 years, but not put us in the same position that we're in uh, now, 20 years from now. Um, the first one of those, let's, let's call them the, the, the stool, the, the legs of the stool, or the tenets of, of what we knew we needed, um, was a thin client. And I think everyone kind of has a different idea of what thin client means. For us, um, it really meant 
uh, our legacy application was built well before the advent of server-side execution. So whether you were a click trader, uh, whether you were uh, a black box uh, uh, trader using a low-level API, building automated trading strategies, literally everything happened on the tower PC next to you in your office. Um, obviously, the world has changed. Um, uh, the world has changed where all of that, none of that, I should say, happens on the client anymore. And so we knew that that would give us an opportunity to dramatically change how we send data to the client application, what types of data, um, and when we sent it, and, and the volume of data. And so we knew we'd be able to really capitalize on that to, to let ourselves build a much lighter weight, much more flexible, and much more accessible front end. The second one, as I mentioned, we needed to preserve the ability to update when we needed to. So we needed to not, we had to work with our partners in terms of when we could upgrade, but we needed to be able to dictate certain releases, whether it's critical bug fixes or whether it's new markets and new, new functionality. And the last one, this instrumentation, this is probably the most important, at least for the long-term health of our business. We really knew we needed to know the end user better. <clears throat> we were making for, for over 20 years really important product decisions in a vacuum in terms of knowing, knowing our users, knowing what features they used, knowing in aggregate uh, what worked and what didn't, um, uh, what pain points our users had. And I think for those of you in, in the room who have worked for or worked with web technologies, I think a lot, a lot of web technology companies take this for granted, being able to make really, really informed uh, decisions from a product perspective. Um, but this is something that we knew we needed because uh, we wouldn't be successful uh, in, in this competitive day and age without really having a better understanding for our end user of our end user. So here's where you're probably thinking, so here's where Rick tells us that's when they moved to the web. But the reality is <clears throat> we were about as entrenched in the Windows tech stack as a company can get. Uh, from the CTO, I was the CTO at the time, so from me down, Literally, everyone was, was a Windows developer through and through. Um, not only that, but we were all uh, terrified of the web. And so uh, we, it, it, literally the guy who wrote the, the expert's guide to C++ CLI um, was one of our more senior engineers. From 2010 to 2013, our idea of innovation was taking our MFC stack and sprinkling a little uh, .NET on it. Um, so it was, it was really a, a tough sell internally. Um, so what did we do? We spent a lot of time and left no stone unturned trying to find a, 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 an excuse to not have to move to the web. Silverlight wasn't yet killed. Um, WPF, you know, we, we wanted WPF to work. Uh, if we had reached this crossroads a year prior, I suspect w I wouldn't be here because we would have gone with WPF. Um, we were fortunate that in, in early 2012, um, there was just this strange sense that Microsoft, they weren't abandoning it, but we just, we didn't see the community grow around WPF that we expected would have been there. Um, the fact that Citrix is on this list, I think shows you how desperate we were uh, to, not, to not move to, to the web. Um, but the reality is, and, and, and I know it wasn't one of those, you wake up one morning and, and you realize this, but it sort of feels like that where really all the signs were pointing to you guys need to move uh, to the web because not only does it tick all those boxes, but um, it does so in a way that would really allow us to transform the way we deliver and deploy this technology. Um, and, and the reality is, and this was, again, early 2012, so um, this was when uh, Chrome OS was really starting to become relevant. Chromebooks themselves were becoming more prevalent. Google was, was making a statement that um, they, at least in their opinion, client-facing technology down the road, and I don't know if that was one year, or five years, or 20 years, but client-facing technology would be built on nothing other than the web platform in the future. And, and I think we, we took that as a positive sign, couple that with the fact that their innovation and their investment in the Chrome browser and the Blink run, uh, rendering uh, runtime, um, which of course is, is the, the rendering pipeline is such, uh, such a, a key part of, of our application, as you'll see here shortly, um, we viewed that as uh, a, a sign that this is, this is a safe investment for us to make. The other fact of the matter is we knew we had a few years. As, as I referred to earlier, our business was strong. Uh, we, had, we had some runway. So our goal was as we get ourselves ready, as we start to build out this functionality, um, the, the investment Google and other browser makers uh, were making in terms of performance, in terms of scale, we'd all meet in, in kind of holy matrimony at the end when we were ready and they were ready and we'd be able to 
to, to build, uh, to, to Mozzie's point, to, to really support these extreme use cases. Um, we, uh, we were basically right. Um, we can't do it all in just the browser now, um, which, is, which is why uh, our, our friends over at OpenFin ha have been so helpful to us. But you know, I've already talked to, to these points. This is why we made this decision. Not only is, uh, does it fundamentally change the way we deliver technology, but it really is a bet on the future, not just from a technology standpoint, but also from a talent standpoint. I mean, we've, I'm sure you all know how difficult it is to get top tier talent. We figured what better way to set ourselves up for long-term success than choosing a stack that would put us in front of a massive pool of really, really talented um, software engineers. Um, so that's, that's sort of the why. Uh, this, is, this is kind of the how. So it's all, it's all great to say that we're gonna choose the web, but actually to, to get a 16 monitor, millions of, of updates per second app to actually work takes a really, takes a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. These are all things that if you're developing the web stack, I suspect you're already using today. Um, no super secrets up here, um, but these are the areas that we've really focused the, the bulk of our investment. Um, Canvas, and, and I'll, I'll just touch on these uh, briefly. Uh, we've, got a, we've got a live demo set up out, out there in the, in the other room, uh, and you can see uh, the extent to which we use Canvas, but we've got a very optimized grid. As I think you all know, trading, trading apps are, are almost exclusively grids these days. Um, so your, your, uh, your grid better be damn fast if you're going to push thousands of them across 16 monitors. And, and we spent a lot of time, uh, we had a lot of inspiration, not only from the OpenFin hypergrid, but also, uh, not a lot of people know this, but the Google Sheets application, that's all, that's all Canvas. And so we spent a lot of time really optimizing that. The last three here, web workers conflation and uh, the, the, the notion of process sharding, they all kind of go hand in hand. So we make heavy use of uh, shared workers um, we have a shared worker that, that essentially connects to our back end and consumes the fire hose of, of market data, of order data, so on and so forth. Its job is then to marshal those, those updates to the various child windows uh, on, the, on the machine. Um, and it's able to do so in a way that it senses back pressure. And so we have conflation at the server. So in our data center, if we sense uh, back pressure on the TCP session, we will dynamically change the rate and the amount of data that we send to the client no differently than if you're watching a Netflix movie and your home internet has a, has a momentary uh, bandwidth uh, constraint. Your, the quality of the movie will go down. It'll go from 4K to 1080p if you're lucky. Um, but you'll still get to enjoy the movie. It doesn't shut off and it'll eventually uh, uh, return to, to the higher quality. It's the exact same idea for us at the server. But with the shared worker, we're able to query each of those child windows, which it is itself a separate uh, render and a separate um, uh, thread, and detect back pressure. So we can do very, very immediate, short-term, uh, second level of conflation on the client. Um, and then the process sharding, and again, this is where the OpenFin container really comes into play. I don't care how fast your canvas is uh, or, or how, how, uh, how well you do conflation. If you try to stretch a, a single uh, mon uh, browser over 16 monitors or even eight monitors, you will, you will see slowdown during really, really busy market events. And so process sharding um, allows us to uh, carve up uh, our application, have a separate thread, more importantly, a separate renderer um, on each monitor. Um, so we can scale horizontally with, generally with the graphics cards uh, of a PC. I only have four monitors set up out there, but um, uh, a picture's worth a thousand words. So I'm gonna show you here uh, a video of, uh, uh, this is actually recorded um, on our 16 monitor setup during a February jobless claims number. Um, this is one of uh, many grids, this is a market grid. Um, uh, here we're gonna pan across. Now each one of these monitors uh, has anywhere from 10 to 50 widgets which are just draggable individual windows within it. Um, I believe this is being replayed at 5x speed. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, uh, Canvas, and I was talking to a few folks outside about this, the Canvas grid doesn't really help that much. It helps a lot on the memory footprint. It doesn't really help that much in terms of updating cell values. Where that really pays a, a, a huge dividend to us is in scrolling. Um, so we're able to uh, do some pretty clever tricks to get scrolling to, to operate. So this is a single PC, single process. Um, I, I know you're probably thinking, who the hell uses something like that? Uh, the answer is very few, um, but we had w w very few people use this um, or go to this, this extreme. 
uh, but we knew we had to, to, to be able to meet the needs of all of our clients, um, even those most extreme use cases. And this is specifically the one where I think when we told Mozzie and his team, we need to be able to do this across 16 monitors, I think they, A, I think they called bullshit on us, <laughs> and, and B, I think they, they like us, um, you know, had to go back and think, is this really even something that we should, that we should uh, try doing? Um, so, so here we are, um, you know, it, it's been a, uh, it, it's been a, a long, somewhat painful journey. Uh, here's a Churchill um, uh, quote, uh, to improve is to change and to be perfect is to change often. Uh, we will never be perfect, uh, but we know that if we want to even try to get close to being perfect, we're gonna have to change a lot. And this industry, as we all know, um, forces us to change, and that rate of change is, is only increasing. And I think uh, um, it was somewhat of a, of a, of a uh, gutsy leap of faith five years ago, but um, uh, the, the technology, I think, has proven out. Um, and I think our choice uh, uh, will allow us to really transform our business. And uh, best of luck uh, to anyone who's going to undertake another or a transformation like this yourselves. Um, so that's all I have. Thanks.